All right, we have a lot of a uh, lot of material to cover here. This is yeah, something's good. So this is actually a, a condensed version of a tutorial that I've given that's three hours. So we're going to be going through it a little bit quick, but feel free to ask questions. I'm going to go ahead and get started now so that we can get a little bit more time in because nobody cares about the front end stuff anyway. I'm uh, Stephen Frost. I'm with Crunchy Data Solutions, um, Crunchy Data Inc., however you want to look at it. Nice. Um, I'm a committer, major contributor. I implemented role-level security in uh, Postgres 9.5, which was just recently released. Um, I did column level privileges. I've implemented the, the role system uh, back in 8.3. So I've done a lot of different contributions to Postgres over the time. So we're going to go ahead and jump right into it, right? So uh, the first big thing is uh, a lot of terminology here. When you're working with Postgres, it's not quite the same as every other system, but uh, you know it's, it's important to understand that terminology so we have a baseline. Yes, sir? Uh, slides will be published, yeah. They're, they're up, uh, they're, if you look for the Postgres Open 2015 slides, they're there. Um, they'll also be posted on the Wiki website for, for this conference once I'm done. So uh, when it comes to Postgres, you'll come across terms such as a cluster or an instance. This is a, essentially one Postgres uh, system that's running. It's a, we, we view that as a, a single postmaster listening on a single IP address and a single port. Right? I mean, of course, we can listen on multiple IP addresses, but the idea is that it's one thing answering the call that comes in, right? And it's also one set of data files. Uh, those data files can be spread out using table spaces. I'll talk about that a little bit later. The other big thing is that it's one write-ahead log. I'm going to go over what write-ahead log is later also. Um, the general operations that you can do at a, at a cluster-wide level, or you know, start, stop, of course, initialization, uh, that's also where all of your file level backups are done at. So whenever you're doing a backup, you have to back up an entire instance or an entire cluster if you're using file system backups. There's other tools that you can use that allow you to do uh, things that are smaller than that, but they're all logical, uh, repli logical uh, backups. Uh, streaming replication. So because there's a write-ahead log, the streaming replication is also something that uh, ends up happening on a cluster level. And then there's a number of different objects that are defined at that level. Users, roles, table spaces, and databases. Those are the kind of objects that exist at a cluster level inside of Postgres. When it comes to what is an actual database in Postgres land, so a database uh, lives inside of a cluster, and you can have more than one database inside of a cluster. There's a few specific permissions that you're allowed to uh, grant at a database level, which include connect, create, which is talking about the ability to create schemas, which I'll talk about next, um, as well as the ability to create temporary objects using the temporary bit. When you're talking about a schema, schemas are namespaces inside of databases. So this is kind of this another level of this onion that we're working towards here. So you have on the outside, you have the, the instance or the cluster. You then get to databases, and then inside of databases, you have multiple schemas. Schema level permissions include create and usage. So create means that you can now create objects, which I'll call principal objects, inside of the database. Uh, you then have the ability to use the, uh, use the schema with the usage option. Um, those permissions are at a schema level, so now you're talking, considering like a directory, right? You know, whether you're allowed to modify the directory, add things into the directory, uh, step into the directory, those are what would be analogous to create and usage when you're talking about schemas. Table spaces are locations for other data files for Postgres. So if you've got five different mount points on your system, you could have five different table spaces that correspond to those different mount points, or maybe you'll have four additional table spaces along with the default table spaces that exist inside of the system to begin with. They are our cluster level, and what that means also is that they can exist with multiple different um, database contents inside of them. So you can have one table space and then have files or tables or indexes that are from different databases on that system using that table space. Table spaces cannot be shared between instances or clusters, however, nor can they be moved between instances or clusters, right? They are associated with a particular instance of the system. All right, now I told you I was gonna tell, tell you about write-ahead log. This is a, a extremely important part of any, uh, any database that uh, has uh, write consistency and also guaranteed write. So, the write-ahead log is important because that's where every write to the database goes first. So whenever uh, you do an insert or you do a delete or you do anything that modifies anything whatsoever in the database, we're going to write it into this write-ahead log first. 
We then, uh, when you go to actually do a commit, we go and make sure that those changes have been committed to disk. That means they've been f-synced all the way out to disk. And only once that happens do we acknowledge the commit and tell the application that said, that asked for the commit that we've actually accepted those changes and have committed them to disk and will not lose them after that. All of the changes to the write-ahead log are CRC'd, um, naturally. And the changes to um, the actual data files in the background, so we're talking now about the table spaces and the other files that exist inside of the system, generally speaking, those changes are done in the background, right? That's what we want to have happen. We want to accept the changes through the write-ahead log and then they get written out to the individual files in the background over a period of time during what's called a checkpoint, which I'm going to talk about next in, uh, here in just a minute. One of the things that you do run into with a write-ahead log is that there can be a contention there, right? Because you have all of these different processes that are all trying to write through the write-ahead log system. That's why one of the things that Postgres supports is the ability to put the write-ahead log in another location. A lot of times what you want to do, especially if you're on spinning rust, is put that on a dedicated set of RAID uh, 10 disks, right? That way you get as much possible performance as you can out of it. Another interesting I issue with r the write-ahead log is that there's two different types of uh, writes that we do into the write-ahead log. We do what's called full page writes, and we also do incremental changes. So a full page write in Postgres is 8K by default, so, and that's the first time we write out a page into the write-ahead log after a checkpoint, which I'll talk about next. That's going to be a full page write, and then any subsequent changes to that same page during that checkpoint will be incremental changes. Um, in 9.5 that we just uh, finally came out with, we are going to be compressing those incremental changes as well. So you'll actually get, uh, your write-ahead logs will get smaller, or at least there's an option now to have them be compressed uh, inside of the, uh, the write-ahead log. Just to kind of hit on it again, what happens after we have a crash, right? So because Postgres has written everything into this write-ahead log first, what happens after a crash, so the database system gets killed or goes down for whatever reason, when it starts back up, it's going to look and say, okay, where was the last point in the write-ahead log that we had a checkpoint, right? A checkpoint is what we have when we actually have written everything out that was pending in the write-ahead log out to the heap files and synced them all, right? Once that's done, we make a mark inside of the write-ahead log saying, okay, everything's synced to this point. Anything that hasn't been synced after that checkpoint is what we're going to replay when the database system starts back up again. So when the database system starts up, we read through the write-ahead log and write all of those changes out to the heap files because we can't trust that they were there because we didn't f-sync them ourselves. We didn't know that we told the kernel we have, you know, the, to write this data out, and we know that it's done. So a checkpoint by default happens in Postgres every five minutes. Um, what's happening here is that it's going through all of the dirty pages that we have and pushing them out to disk and f-syncing them. And what we try to do is we actually try to spread out the time that we're doing those f-syncs over that five-minute period. So it can be forced for a couple of different reasons. Um, one of the reasons that a checkpoint might be forced is that we've run out of room inside of the write-ahead log area that we've been provided to write more write-ahead log. Right, what this means is that there's an option uh, checkpoint segments inside of Postgres that I'll talk about a little bit later, but what's happening is that you know, we don't want to just write out as much write-ahead log as we have available to the point where we fill the disk, because if the disk ends up filling, out on, uh, filling up on your X-log volume, we can't accept any more transactions, right? because we can't write out to the write-ahead log first, which is what we have to do. So there's a configuration option that says, okay, we're going to take and work with a subset of the amount of disk available, and once we run out of that space, if we haven't hit that five-minute mark and, have been able to, and are able to reclaim some of the uh, X logs that were already written, we will forcibly start in a checkpoint, which can be very expensive, and what will happen is that that will immediately basically start F-syncing everything out to disk, right, so that we can get back right ahead log space so that we can start accepting transactions again. So again, if, if you have questions, you know, please don't feel too afraid to stop me, but we do have a lot of things that we're going to go through. All right, so the Postgres development group provides a set of packages, both for uh, Red Hat and for our, uh, in, in, our, in terms of RPMs, 
as well as uh, Debian-based systems. Uh, those are really the principal ones we have now. There's also the, the Windows ones. I'm not going to talk too much about that because we're at scale. Um, <laughs> just saying. So uh, both sets of uh, packages from the community allow you to have multiple major versions of Postgres installed concurrently and allows for smooth major version upgrades using the PG upgrade tool, which is uh, really quite handy. Uh, in all of the systems that I run today, this is what I use, right? So I use everything from the PGDG uh, because those are the ones that are up to date, they're well maintained, they're supported through the community mailing list, and they're updated, uh, the releases of them are updated in coordination with the Postgres team. So whenever a, a security change or anything is coming out, we, uh, we coordinate that with all of the different packagers uh, for Debian and all the Debian-based systems and Red Hat and all the Red Hat-based systems, um, as well as the Windows, uh, Windows builds. So on a Debian or Ubuntu-based system, in this kind of an environment, it's app.postgresql.org. So you would add that into your sources list. Um, you can use LSB release if you want to. And you know, here it's pretty straightforward, right? It's app get, app get, app get, right? Done. And we have the, uh, and then we're, we've got the version installed. This is with 9.4, but of course uh, 9.5 is out now. So if you want, just changing that to 9.5 should work just fine and that'll pull in the, uh, the latest version. In terms of how the configuration layout works when you've done this, so all the config files for a given instance or a given cluster, I was saying, live inside of a x.y, so that's a major dot minor version. Well, in Postgres land, that's a major version, right? x.y is a major version. So 9.3 is a major version. 9.4 is a major version. 9.5 is a major version, right? And then inside of that directory under Etsy Postgres, uh, because you, with Debian, you're able to have multiple different instances installed as well, there's an instance name. So in this case, it's main, right? That's the default. So whenever you do this app get install, you're going to get a instance of whatever version, so 9.4 in my example, and that instance is going to be named main. All the data files end up in varlib, uh, naturally, but it's varlib postgres, and then the, that major, dot, uh, major version and then the instance name. Uh, binaries, so the binaries are common to all of the instances, right? There's only one set of major version binaries. Those live in, var, uh, in user lib Postgres following that x.y slash bin, and then there's a bunch of wrapper scripts, right? So if you're ever wondering, you know, you want to go look at PSQL for whatever reason and you're confused on a Debian-based system why it looks like a Perl script, it's because it is. Right, so it's a it's actually a wrapper for PSQL because this whole notion of multiple different instances installed on a system is not something that the the Postgres utilities themselves directly support. So the Debian maintainers, um, which I think is fantastic, have come up with a number of wrapper scripts that provide the ability to have multiple clusters in, on the same box and be able to work with them very easily. Uh, logs are pretty natural. Um, note that uh, there's a difference between what I'll call normal operation Postgres logs and what are called the startup logs. Um, so the startup logs are just kind of the, the bootstrapping of getting Postgres running has its own set of log files. Um, in a Debian-based system, all of those logs go into var log Postgres. It's a little bit different on Red Hat. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then there's one init script that starts everything on a Debian-based system for us. Don't ask me about system D. I, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I'm, I'm, yeah, let's not go there right now. Um, so with these clusters, on, so on Debian, those different instances are called clusters, right? And so these tools are uh, all, say, cluster in them. So PGLS clusters gives you a, a listing of all of the different clusters that exist on your system. And that can be across different major versions as well as multiple instances inside of a given major version. Uh, PGCTL cluster is what you use for controlling Postgres. So on a, on a system like Red Hat where it's not using these wrapper scripts, the command is called PG underscore CTL. I'll talk about that in a minute, but on Debian-based systems, you want to use PGCTL cluster, right? And that's what you can use to start, stop, signal the database. Uh, generally, you want to signal it to perhaps reload files, uh, reload the configuration files. And then there's a dash dash cluster option. So this is one of those cases that's kind of weird, right? So this dash dash cluster, that's two dashes, sorry, specifies which option or which cluster to work on inside of a, of a Debian-based system. Um, and here you can see I've got it dash dash cluster 904 slash main. 
So the way you specify it, it's always x dot y slash and then the instance name for basically all of the tools. If you don't specify it, there is a default that's picked up and used, um, which generally is whatever the most whatever is running on port 5432, which is the Postgres port. That's where the default is going to be. And here I can you can see that they also tells you what the data directory, what the log file is when you're using PGLS clusters. There's a bunch of different configuration options that are available. I'll talk about that in a minute when it comes to Debian-based uh, clusters. All right, so now for a Red Hat-based installation. On Red Hat, you're using yum.postgresql.org, um, and this, you know, whatever RPM-based you know, system you want to use. Um, when you install it, it will go ahead and initialize the cluster. Um, you can run multiple different major versions in, uh, in parallel. It's a, it's a little bit ugly, in my opinion, but it does work. Um, this is how you can do a group install that pulls in all the different dependencies that you want. And then here you have to, uh, sorry, on a, on a Red Hat system you don't get the database initialized. You have to do this in NITDB yourself. So that's what you do after you get the actual packages installed. You have to do your own NITDB and then that will create the cluster for you, create the instance. And then you can use the CTL to, uh, to start it up. All right, so on a Red Hat-based system, everything, all the data files and whatnot live in this varlib pgsql. Um, so you don't have quite the same, it, it's not quite as convenient to have multiple different clusters. You don't get all of the cute wrapper scripts that you get on a Debian-based system. All of the configuration files that I'll talk about here in a minute live inside of the data directory on a Red Hat-based system, which personally I don't like, although that's kind of the way Postgres operates when you're using it um, when you install it from source also. Uh, binaries go into this user dash, or user slash pgsql dash x dot y slash bin, which I find bizarre. Um, and then the logs are in var lib instead of var log. And there's actually two different locations. So you have a startup log that's here in this kind of major version directory and then the actual regular operational logs are in data slash pg uh, underscore log on a Red Hat based environment. So I, I will fully admit I'm not a Red Hat guy, so take all of this with a little bit of grain of salt. <laughs> I went through it and did it and it's where I found that everything, but just be aware of it. Oh, and you also need an independent init script on, uh, on a Red Hat based system for each of the different major versions you want to run. All right, so when it comes to configuring Postgres, there's kind of uh, really four major uh, configuration files. There's the main what I'll call a main configuration, which is postgresql.conf, and that's where you configure a lot of things like how much memory Postgres uses, how much, uh, what port it listens on, all of that kind of information. But then when you want to get into, okay, the question of how do I connect to the database? What do I do, you know, how do I get users connected? What are they doing? So to do that, what you have to use is PGHBA and PGIdent. So PGHBA is, uh, allows you to control what, uh, authentication method is used to, uh, for the user to connect. PGIdent is for mapping users between, you know, you may have multiple different uh, system users. So if you imagine on a Unix-based box, you might have 10 Unix users that all map to one Postgres user. You can specify a mapping like that using this pgident.conf. And then uh, there's a pglog, uh, that's not a config file. I'm not sure what that is. I think I was getting at the point is that inside of the data directory is a PG log on, on Red Hat systems. So on Debian-based systems, all these configurations are in that Etsy Postgres directory like I was talking about. One of the things that to be really careful about when you're on a Red Hat-based system is don't modify the other stuff in that data directory. There's a lot of things in there that are really important, like your data, and you don't want that to be destroyed. So be careful whenever you're working inside of the, the Postgres data directory and you're modifying things inside of it. So as I mentioned, there are some Debian-specific configuration files. These are uh, only exist on Debian, and these are for working with these different clusters. So there's a startup config that allows you to say, if you want to have the cluster automatically started or whether you want to have it disabled or has to be manually started. Um, PGCTL, which just tells uh, you know, what options to pass to PGCTL. Generally, you don't need it. Same thing with this environment um, option, environment configuration uh, file on Debian. I don't generally change it, but it's there if you need it to set some kind of environment variable before starting the database. 
There's also uh, cluster configuration information inside of this common directory. So on a Debian-based system, there's actually a, a Postgres common package that's installed along with your, uh, all the different Postgres packages that get installed. And that provides this information about setting up clusters. So inside of the uh, Postgres common directory, you can have different settings for how you want clusters to be created. You can also control which clusters are the default cluster for certain users. You can actually have different users um, have different default clusters so that they don't have to specify dash dash cluster all of the time. Uh, users can also set that themselves uh, through the environment variables uh, that uh, the wrapper scripts will respect as well. And then there's a, a PG upgrade cluster dot D which isn't really used very much but it could be populated by extensions to handle doing upgrades from different uh, across major versions of Postgres. So on Red Hat systems, there aren't, isn't quite as much in terms of Red Hat specific config files, simply because Red Hat doesn't have all of those same cluster uh, helper scripts and whatnot. So mainly it's just the init scripts, which generally you don't need to modify too much. Um, thankfully, some of the things that you used to have to modify have been moved out of there. You don't have to specify the port, for example, if you want to do a different port on a Red Hat based system. All right. So I'm going to talk about configuration. So these are configuration items that are inside of PostgreSQL.conf. Um, so this is kind of what you might want to do when you're first installing a system. This is for 9.4 and earlier. 9.5 is a little bit different in this area. Um, unfortunately, this, this deck hasn't been updated to, uh, to account for that. So just be aware of that. Read the release notes uh, if you're looking at 9.5, and that'll cover what the differences are um, between the releases. The big one here is if you want to allow other people to access the system, um, like on a Debian-based system, it'll start up with only listening on localhost, and you'll have to change listen addresses to star to allow people to connect in from remote. So of course, you know, on a Debian-based system, it starts up in a, in a default secure manner. Uh, checkpoint segments, this is what I was talking about with the write-ahead log. In 9.5, it's called min wall size and max wall size, so that's one of the big differences. There is no more checkpoint segments. And what that does is that just controls how much of that write-ahead log space is allowed uh, by, you know, Postgres is allowed to use. Um, so again, that impacts whether or not you're having to do checkpoints more frequently than you should be. Um, checkpoint completion target. The default is um, 0.5, which means that if we have a five-minute uh, checkpoint timeout, we're going to try to complete the checkpoint, that is, writing all of those changes out to the, the heap files or the file system, the data directory in two and a half minutes. Um, my experience is that there's not really any point to waiting, um, or to, to being that aggressive, I should say. So you might as well just go ahead and set checkpoint completion target to 0.9, which says, okay, so across five minutes, you know, use like four and a half minutes or so to complete the checkpoint during. Um, and, I mean, in my two cents, we ought to get rid of this option, but, it, you know, for now, at least set it to, to 0.9. Um, effective cache size, so effective cache size is something that is not actually ever allocated. Um, what it's just used for is it tells Postgres, it gives Postgres some idea, okay, how likely is it that the pages from this particular relation, this particular table or index, how likely is it that that stuff's in memory, right? If it's really likely that it's in memory, that's great. We're probably going to use an index-based scan. If it's less likely to be in memory, we may move over to doing a sequential scan instead. So generally, I would set this to about half of RAM, but you can actually look and see, you know, okay, how big is your Linux file system cache? And if that's the only thing it's being used for, you can just set it to whatever that is. Uh, max wall senders is set to zero by default because it does take up a like really small amount of resources. Um, I generally set it, bump it up to three because you have to restart the system in order to change it. So I find that it's better to get just go ahead and get that set up ahead of time. That's what allows you to do things like PG base backup or to have a, a follower, right, like a, a replication system. All right, when you're doing logging, the default logging in Postgres sucks. This is what I do um, in terms of just kind of real basics uh, for an initial setup. So logging every connection to the database, every disconnection, um, th those are pretty obvious. Log lock weights is actually not as obvious, but it's ridiculously helpful. So whenever the system is stuck between two different processes due to a lock, Right? And it could be any kind of a lock. It could be a table lock. It could be a row level lock. You know, after a few seconds, what we're going to do is run what's called the deadlock detector. 
right? The deadlock detector is going to say, okay, these processes have been stuck for a while. Are they deadlocked, right? And assuming that it's not deadlocked, which generally is what you are hoping for, Postgres will then, if you have this enabled, kick out a message saying, hey, I've been sitting here waiting on a lock for, you know, a minute, just FYI, right? And that can be indicative of someone's gone in and started a transaction and acquired some locks and then is just sitting there, right? Idle in transaction, not doing anything. And those are people you want to go, you know, over to their desk and kick them, you know, kick their chair and say, get out of your transaction so we can have processes move forward again. Um, Logman duration statement is important because this, in milliseconds, what you're specifying here is, okay, if a query has gone longer than this amount of time, I want you to log it so I can go review it and figure out why that query took so long, right? 100 milliseconds is a really long time, especially when you're trying to load web pages for a database to be responsive. You really want databases to be more responsive than that. Log temp files is really handy because uh, in the operations of Postgres, there are things that we do when we need to use a lot of, they can end up using up a lot of disk space, like a sort, right? So if we have an on-disk sort that's happening, what will happen is if you have log temp files set to zero, then any file that we create for temporary purposes, like doing an on-disk sort, for example, will be logged. That can also be very indicative of why a particular query was slow. Maybe I had to go, you know, maybe Postgres has a sort two gigs worth of data, right? That's going to take a little while um, for that particular query. And then log auto vacuum in duration, setting that to zero basically says, okay, I want to log every single thing that auto vacuum does, which I find very helpful as well because a lot of cases, you know, you see some kind of performance impact and maybe it's auto vacuum kicking in. This will log all that information for you about what tables auto vacuum has been uh, vacuuming and what it's been doing. There's also a really important thing called log line prefix, um, which you would think would be set to something reasonable, but it really isn't. So this is what I use. Um, it's pretty complicated. The slides will be posted. I'm not going to go through all of this since we uh, have a lot to cover here, but uh, that's kind of what I end up using. Collects all the important information. Uh, one of the new ones is application name. That's one that you may want to really look at and see if you have. If you're already running Postgres, you may not have application name logged. That's helpful. Uh, all the Postgres applications will set that for you. You can set that for yourself also. Whenever you're connecting to Postgres through libpq, you can set your own application name during that connection string, and then that information shows up in the log as well as in some of the informational tables inside of Postgres. All right, so here's PGHBA in a nutshell. Um, everything's red top to bottom. So here we have the different, uh, you know, different connection methods here on the left. So local means a local Unix socket. You then have, a, and you can specify a database where you can specify all databases, the user, and then the, the method. Um, if it's over the network, you have an address setting, and then there's a bunch of different options that you can set. Addresses can be either V4 or V6. They can include CIDR notation if you want. Um, there's a special option called reject, which if you hit that when you're reading through the file, means Postgres will just kick you right back out. Um, and so that allows you to kind of have cutouts inside of your Postgres config, your Postgres PGHBA.conf. In terms of the actual different methods that are listed there, these are the different methods that exist inside of the, uh, that are supported by Postgres. Peer is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about Unix sockets. So that's, we're just going to ask the kernel, who is this person that's connecting? We're going to get back the Unix username, and that's what we're going to allow you to authenticate as. Um, and then you can, map that to multiple different users using that pgident config file like I was talking about. GSS is, is Kerberos. Um, it's also uh, SSPI on, uh, on Windows. So if you're setting up a pghba.conf on Windows, you want to use set it to SSPI. But if you're using it on a, on a Unix box, Linux box, which hopefully everybody is, you're using GSS. Um, works really well with MIT or, or Heimdall, uh, Kerberos. I've, I've played with both and been happy with it. You can also integrate it with Active Directory. So Active Directory is actually Kerberos underneath. You can have a Linux box join to your Active Directory domain, or you can have an independent realm that has a, a trust relationship between your MIT or Heimdall realm and the um, Windows realm, and that allows you to do single sign-on with Postgres, which is really, really handy. Uh, there's also the ability to do uh, certificate-based installation uh, or certificate-based uh, certificate -based authentication. Um, this is using SSL client-side certificates. So in, when you're doing that inside of your PGIdent, what you're mapping there as the system username is the uh, common name. 
and that's what you use to map to whatever you want, whatever you want that user to be allowed to log into on the Postgres side, whatever Postgres username. Um, one of the things that's interesting that I've never played with, to be honest, is that, or that I've never done before, but it works just fine, is that when you're talking about GSS and Kerberos, the system name is the user at realm. So it'd be like, you know, sfrost at mit.edu or something like that. You can have that as a Postgres username inside of the database if you want. You don't have to map it to a simpler name. I typically do, but you don't have to. You can set it to just be that, and I've seen people do that, and it's kind of interesting, and works well in, in large environments where you have a lot of different people across a lot of different realms. <laughs> These are some methods that work just fine, probably most of what you're using. Um, I don't like them. I much prefer the stronger authentication methods I've discovered. Uh, MD5 is your stock kind of username password. That's probably what most people are using. Um, it, it works. It's not what I would recommend, but it does work. PAM is complicated, so the reason for that is that Postgres doesn't run as root, so you have to set up things like SASLOTD um, if you want to have Postgres be able to authenticate users using PAM um, or using, you know, using your, your password files, uh, etc passwd and etsy shadow. Obviously, with that and with MD5, really, you want to be using SSL um, encryption. I, I would say just generally you want to be using SSL, but that's just me. We also support Radius. Um, for anybody who's got some old school stuff that's still doing Radius authentication, um, Postgres now has support for that. And then there's also the traditional password base, which is just like, uh, you know, password with SSL is like OpenSSH, right? I mean, you, you feed the password over to the, well, with password base auth, you feed the password over to the server, and the server checks it against your password files, and, and you're in, right? So that's, that's how that works. Um, these are methods I don't really like. Um, LDAP is, it gets a bad rep from me simply because I know that if you're running LDAP 99% of the time, you're running Active Directory and you should just be using Kerberos with Active Directory instead of using LDAP authentication. Um, there are some environments where, yeah, you're running open LDAP and you actually have an LDAP and you want to be doing binds against it for authentication purposes. But the other problem is that, again, you're passing the credentials of the user through the system. Right, whenever you're using uh, LDAP or password or MD5, the user's password gets exposed to the server. It has to. Um, with Kerberos and GSS API, that doesn't happen, which is one of the really nice things about it. Same with uh, SSL-based certificates. IDENT just shouldn't be used, and Trust really shouldn't be used either. They're just not, they're not secure by any, any way, shape, or form, in my opinion. I know some people have used Trust in the past because they think it's faster than MD5. Uh, maybe it is, but I, I wouldn't recommend it at all um, because it literally bypasses any authentication and potentially allows you to log in as any user. So just be aware of that. So if you have Trust configured, you should go change it. All right, PG Ident. So here's what I was talking about before where you have a, a map name. That's what you can specify in your PGHBA. So you can have multiple different mappings depending on the authentication method that you're using. And then you have what's called an auth user or a system user, and then you have what your Postgres user is. So for example here, this Joe would be uh, a Joe that's installed on the Unix system, right, for peer-based um, authentication with peer map. And that user on the Unix file system can log in as Bob. Realize that Joe can't log in as Joe with this configuration, right? If you want Joe to be able to log in with, you know, as Joe, you have to specify another name, you know, another row here, that allows that, or you can use a regular expression. So here's a regular expression uh, for the Kerberos mappings. So what that regular expression does is you, you know, whatever you want your match to be, that's what we're going to allow over here on the on the right. So if I'm S Frost at snowman.net as shown here, this backslash one with this regex will be S Frost. So that'll allow any user at snowman.net to log in as their short name to the system. This, in, this particular mapping also allows me to log in as the Postgres user. So here for a certificate mapping, like with cert name, this would be my common name inside of the SSL certificate that I'm using to log into the system. And that allows me to log in as this S for us Postgres user. And that's how you specify map equals whatever map, you know, whatever map name you want to use on the authentication line inside of, or on the method line inside of pghba.conf. All right, next question. So now we're going to talk about running Postgres. So a big question is always, you know, is Postgres up, right? So there's a couple different utilities to use. You can use uh, 
uh, just the service command to check status, and that'll you know tell you like it's on a Debian-based system, so there's multiple different instances, and for each instance it'll list whether it's online or not. There's a PG is ready uh, command that's available that you can use, um, and it is supported by the wrapper scripts in Debian, so you can pass the dash dash cluster option to it. Um, and of course, you can always just connect with PSQL, um, which is very handy. The PG is ready is also available on the RPM based systems, but it doesn't accept the dash dash cluster option. All right, so using PSQL. So if you're working with Postgres a lot, a lot of what you're probably doing, at least if you're a command line guy like I am, is using PSQL, right? There's a number of commands that PSQL takes all the commands that PSQL, once you're inside of it, so this is like you're inside of the PSQL shell here, right? So inside of that shell, anything that starts with a backslash is going to be a command that's interpreted and handled by the PSQL binary. Anything else is like just sent to the server, and whatever the server comes back with, PSQL displays, right? That's essentially how it works. So the big thing is, you know, backslash question mark, is uh, really helpful to get a whole listing of what the different options are. Uh, backslash H is ridiculously helpful because backslash H, what we do with Postgres is all the Postgres documentation has the syntax for everything that the Postgres server accepts, all the SQL that it accepts. All of that syntax is then stripped out of the documentation and included with PSQL. So you can do backslash H select, right, or backslash H insert, and you'll get the full syntax for that command. It's very, very helpful. Uh, you know, control D, your backslash Q to exit. Any queries that return information will be displayed to you, and backslash X can be used to uh, do what's called an extended display, where you're getting a separate line for every column in the data set. So for example, this is uh, what backslash X looks like. Um, table is a really handy command if you're not familiar with it. That's the same thing as select star from. Uh, it also accepts limit. It's very, very handy and allows you to have you know, it's just shorter and simpler. PG stat activity is a table that tells you what users are logged into the database right now and what they're doing. So here I've got uh, expanded display on, so each line is actually a column, and each record starts with a record header like this. And then this is all the different information that you have inside of the database that you can access through PSQL about the users that are connected such as you know, what users connected, what their application that you're, they're using is, if they're using one of the applications that sets that information, you know, the client information. So here there's no client address because I was connected in over a local Unix socket. When their process started, uh, if they're waiting is an indication of whether they're waiting on a lock or not. Um, the state is whether what they're doing right now, if they're running something or if they're idle or if they're idle in transaction. And then query is actually whatever the last query they ran or the current query that they're running is, sorry. So that's what, that's what the query ends up being. All right, so if you want to look at what databases exist, backslash L gives you the list of databases. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the different PSQL commands just because there's a huge set of, you know, slew of them, but uh, that's what you can see with backslash L. It tells you the different databases. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Yes. You when you are when you run PSQL, you go into a shell, right? A PSQL shell, and that's where you can issue backslash commands and then do selects and queries and whatnot. If you want to send a command to PSQL from Bash, right? You would do uh, dash C. Um, is the option that you pass to PSQL. So you can just do, on the command line, on a bash line, you can do PSQL dash C, you know, and then double quote, select star from whatever, and double quote, right? And there's a whole bunch of different options there for uh, dealing with formatting, dealing with table alignment, dealing with headers and footers. So you can, you know, you can strip everything out and have like a select query that runs underneath the bash to so run PSQL and just gets whatever that data element that you want out is which is, you know, a lot of times what people are doing, and then you can shove that into a bash variable if you want. Works just fine. Yes? It's a toggle, yes. Yeah, backslash X, once you've turned that on, it'll stay that way forever until you turn it off. Yes? Backslash question mark is, you know... I, I think, I'm not sure what you mean by what command you're looking for. <laughs> 
So what I would suggest, if you're not sure what the definitions of the commands are, like the queries that you're talking, you know, if that's what you're talking about, I would say if you do just backslash h, you'll get a list of all the top-level commands that Postgres supports, and then once you've got that, you can go to the Postgres documentation and look it up. All right, so templates. I'm going to cover this really quickly because we're already, I mean, we're already at 40 minutes and I've got a bunch of slides left. So templates are, are something that you can create, and then if you do a create database using that template, we just basically copy all the files from that templated database into your new database. So if you're creating lots of databases for whatever reason, and you have like a, a common set of stuff you want to be in all of those databases, create a template database, fill it with that stuff, and then whenever you create a new database, just specify with template to the create database command, and then that'll be pulled over. All right, creating users is very straightforward. It's create user on the command line, or you can do uh, create space user inside of uh, PSQL itself. So this is inside of a PSQL shell, and then you can set a password and whatnot. It's pretty straightforward. User privileges. So there's a lot of different user privileges that are really important. Um, super user is the big one. Don't give it out to just anybody. It allows you to do lots of different stuff. You can access the database in ways that you really shouldn't be allowed to. So be very cautious with that one. Create role is more powerful than just being able to create roles because it allows you to modify roles as well. So that's one that you don't want to just give out to anybody. Um, login is, you know, by default, if you do create user, you'll get the login privilege. If you do create role, it's like a group, so you won't have the login bit. So if you've done a create role and you don't know why you can't log in as that new user you created, it's because it doesn't have the login rights. You need to go change that on the system. Um, and you can do alter user to change that information. And if you're curious about how to use alter user, you do backslash h alter user. Um, and then you'll get that information. Um, I'm not going to hit on the rest of this stuff, but there's also replication for, um, for changing, you know, for what users are allowed to log, to connect in to run PG based backup or to, you know, be as a, uh, as a slave system connecting in to pull data down to be, uh, you know, like a hot standby or a read only uh, replica. All right, roles. So roles are kind of complicated in Postgres. Uh, roles are roles, users are roles, groups are roles, everything's a role inside of Postgres. So when you are thinking about how you want to do uh, group membership, you know, use create role, set up your groups that way, set up your users with create user, that way that login bit gets set the right way, and then when you want to add someone to a group, it's using the grant command. So you say grant Joe to, or sorry, grant, you know, whatever the group name is, so grant admins to Joe, right? And that allows Joe to now have whatever the rights of the admin you, uh, role have. Uh, inherit's really, really important. Um, what it allows you to do is that it allows you to automatically inherit the rights of that role. So for example, with the admin role, um, in fact, I'm gonna go over right here. So with the admin role, you can set up, um, you can set it up as no inherit, and that means that when you connect in, you don't automatically get all of those privileges. Instead, you have to actually do a set role to it. So this is how I like to set things up for kind of a pseudo-like mentality. Note that it doesn't ask you for a password. There's no way to get Postgres to ask you for a password on a set role right now. I think that may change one day, but don't get your hopes up. Um, so you create this role admin with no inherit, grant Postgres to admin, and then create this user Joe and grant admin to Joe. So now Joe can log in. He's a regular user, doesn't have any particular, you know, special rights, but he can do a set role to Postgres when he's ready to. So that's how, and then, yeah, so that's how that works. All right, uh, grant and revoke. So this is going to kind of cover what I recommend changing um, on Postgres. So. By default, Postgres comes with what's called a public schema that anyone can uh, create objects inside of. I don't generally recommend that because that schema is in everybody's search path, so it can just get obnoxious um, by default. So I, would, I always revoke create on that schema whenever I set up a new system and always have per schema or you know, per user schemas instead. So whenever I create a user, I'm gonna create a schema for them also, and then they'll have rights on that schema and they can do whatever they want with that. Um, and then if I have something I want to create to have available to everybody on the system, I'll go put that inside of the public schema. Uh, these are the different ways and different options for uh, privileges on a system. Uh, depending on what type of object it is, there's different options that are available. Um, and you can go all the way down to individual columns when you're talking about select, insert, update rights. 
Functions are important to think about. Um, functions with, uh, whenever you do a create function, by default, everybody's allowed to execute that function, assuming that they can see the schema with, that the function is inside of. And then you can also have what are called security definer functions. Those are like uh, functions with a set UID bit, right? So whenever you call that function, the function is going to change rights that it's r running as over to whoever owns it, and whoever the owner of that um, is, and then that's who it, the rest of the function is going to run as. So be aware of that. That's how security definer functions work inside of Postgres. All right. So I covered a little bit of this already, default permissions for execute, um, for functions rather. Uh, everything else is basically secure by default, right? So you create a table, nobody else has rights to that table until you grant them access to it. Uh, unless you set up default privileges on the schema. So you can set up a default privilege for either a role for a schema, for a role inside of a schema, um, and that allows you to set it up so that when you create a new table, it will automatically have some set of grants that are allowed to it. You can also use grant on all. So if you want to grant some access to all the tables in the, uh, in the schema, you can use that command. If you're wondering how big your database is, um, this is pretty straightforward. It's PG database size is a function you can call, pass it the database name, and then PG size pretty just makes it look nice. Um, you can look at the size of individual tables using PG total relation size. Note that that particular command will actually include the size of indexes and the heap and the toast tables and everything. So that, that'll give you the total size. Um, that can, you know, that could cross over different table spaces, of course. So both of these will go across any table spaces that are involved and collect up all that information for you. If you're looking at the size of the uh, individual table, like you don't want to look at how big the indexes are associated with it, you can just use PG relation size. And that is what that'll give you. That'll give you just the size of that relation and not include the indexes. So here's uh, you know handy little command if you want to look at you know wh what's the size of uh, all the tables inside of a particular schema you know how much how much disk space is this user using up right this is a way you can do that assuming that you have per user schemas all right creating a table space is kind of tricky there's a bunch of options you have to set up and things you have to get right um, some of the big ones are you have to have created the directory already. It must be empty. Permissions got to be 700 on it. And you have to specify the full path to the directory when you're creating a table space. Do not ever create table spaces inside of your um, data directory in Postgres. Don't mess with the data directory at all. Create table spaces somewhere else. Okay? Postgres is, you know, feels like it has control and domain over everything in the data directory. Don't be creating table spaces in there. I've seen that too often, and I just have to bring it up. Um, also, I, I strongly recommend you don't use a mount point directly, right? Create a directory underneath of that mount point and then use that as your table space. Um, in my opinion, that's just best practices, but I think, there's, I think there's some good reasons for it also. If you want to get information about the table spaces, that's backslash deb on your, uh, at your PSQL command line, and that'll give you the location. These ones don't have location information because they live in the Postgres data directory, so that's like varlib postgresql 9.4 slash main on Debian. And then you can use PG table space size to get the size that Postgres thinks of all the objects inside of that table space. Uh, dropping a table space, you have to have the table space be empty before you can drop it. Um, there's some handy commands that allow you to move sets of objects inside of, you know, from one table space to another. Um, but other, you may have to actually connect to multiple different databases to move all the different objects or to drop all the different objects. And once you've dropped everything inside of the table space or moved them out, then you can actually go and drop the table space itself. All right, file-based backups. So a PG-based backup with wall receive is really, really handy for doing simple backups. That does require that max wall senders I talked about before. It's one time and it does the whole database, so there's no incrementals or anything that are available with that, um, which isn't great. And you have to have the write-ahead logs that um, were done, uh, were created during that base backup in order to restart the system. So when you run PG base backup, there's an option there to stream or to pull down all of the X logs. Make sure you use that. I recommend the streaming option. Um, JD did a talk yesterday, uh, for those who weren't here, sorry, but he did a talk yesterday about other back, you know, more about backing up the database and using PG dump. Um, 
I'll talk about that here in a minute. But one of the things that's also important is that this includes all the data files and all the indexes and everything. So when you do a restore, you don't have to recreate indexes or anything. You do when you're using something else, like when you're using PG Dump, for example. So the other uh, main one is using logical-based backups. This is where you use PG Dump and PG Dump All. Um, these end up being essentially text-based uh, dumps. They don't include any indexes or anything. The entire system has to be repopulated. All the indexes have to be recreated when you're doing a restore. So it's kind of painful. All right, backups don't work unless you restore them. All right, so just best practice, make sure you're testing your restores, make sure you're actually doing restores and making sure that they work. Consider multiple different options for how to do a restore. Um, if you're doing a restore with PG base backup, it's pretty straightforward. PG base backup creates a tarball for you. All you gotta do is extract that tarball. All the data should be included. If you did the wall options like I was talking about, all the wall files should be there as well. Um, and that'll have all of the data since the, you know, uh, any data that was created after the backup will be gone, right? Unless you save the write ahead log um, and can replay the write ahead log. Uh, and you can talk for an hour just about backups with Postgres. So if you have questions about that, feel free to ask me. All right, PG Backrest is a really, really nice backup utility. It's available here, github.com PG Masters Backrest. Um, it's for file-based backups, and it handles all of the craziness about write-ahead logs and everything else is handled for you. Um, you can do, and it also supports full point-in-time recovery. It's parallel. You can do differential and incremental backups. Really nice utility if you're looking at a large uh, system. I strongly recommend looking at PG Backrest as your backup solution. Um, these are the settings that you need to set to enable inside of PG Backrest. You can look at, or inside of PostgreSQL.com to use PG Backrest. You can uh, find all that information from the PG Backrest pa uh, web page as well. I'm not going to cover too much of it. Um, this is how you configure PG Backrest. So there's a Etsy PG Backrest.com file. There's a repo path, which basically says that's the path where all your backups and all your write ahead log goes to and then you need to tell it where the database lives. Uh, and then you can have multiple different uh, clusters in, that are supported inside of one configuration file with PG Backrest. That's what, the, that's what main is here. So main is my, just like the 9.4 slash main, that's what main is here inside of PG Backrest. Uh, there's an info command with PG Backrest which tells you information about the last backup. There's also a JSON version of this that gives you lots more data that you can then extract and parse and stick into a Nagios check if you want. Um, and then speaking of Nagios, check Postgres for monitoring. So monitoring is obviously a really important aspect of, of database systems. Check Postgres.pl is a great monitoring tool for Postgres, integrates with Nagios. You can get it to dump out statistical information and have it be, you know, graphed with pretty graphs and whatnot through Nagios and with, with Izinga or whatever you're using. It works uh, pretty well. also supports custom queries, which are really nice. These are the ones that I typically play with in terms of uh, a minimum recommended set of checks to be running with Check Postgres. Sorry. Uh, monitoring log files. So the same person who wrote Check Postgres also wrote Tail and Mail. So if you have, log you have Postgres log files, you do, right? It's nice to be able to monitor them and make sure that you're tracking any errors and whatnot. I like to use Tail and Mail to do that. Um, it's pretty straightforward and it works quite well. You can also reconfigure Postgres to use what's called the CSV log. CSV log allows you to dump out the information from the Postgres logs into CSV files and then load those back up into the database. Um, and there's lots of other options for doing your own rotation if you don't want to use uh, log rotate. All right, configuring and tuning Postgres. Never seem to have enough time for this section. So shared buffers is this massive pool of stuff, of, of memory that we allocate um, whenever we start up. And that's where, that's kind of the Postgres local cache, right? So that allows us to avoid going back to the kernel and going back and forth whenever we need to get data off of, uh, off of disk or out of the cache. So it's really tricky to tune right. Um, if your working set is less than the amount of memory you have in the box, I generally recommend setting shared buffers up enough that you can set your, have your entire working set in memory or maybe your entire database in memory if it's small. Um, and that works out really well. If it's larger than that, I find that it can be helpful to actually have shared buffers be less, significantly less, down to the point of being only maybe a gig, right? And what that does is that means that we're going out to the kernel a lot more, but it also means we're doing less double caching, 
right? So whenever we have our own cash and the kernel has its cash, there's a risk of double caching there, right? Which just ends up wasting memory. That memory could be better used for running queries and doing other things potentially. WorkMem is the setting that we use to figure out how much memory we're allowed to use with this query. So it's more complicated than that, but just realize that if you up WorkMem more, queries will be allowed to use more memory for doing things like building hash tables or doing sorting. So it can be really, really helpful. Uh, the default used to be one meg. We just upped that a little bit. I think it's like eight now, so which is better than one, but it's still pretty freaking small if you ask me. So I tend to bump this thing up pretty well. Uh, the only downside to it is that if you have lots and lots and lots of connections, you run that risk of uh, running the bit system out of memory. Realize that Postgres is actually very good at handling issues when it comes to memory. All right, I got five minutes left. Um, so it's actually not like the end of the world if Postgres ends up um, using all of the, the memory in the system because it'll get a memory error and it'll clean up everything very nicely. So it's not, it's not like a huge problem. Don't run out of room for PGX log though. All right, maintenance work mem is what we use to create indexes. Um, so you wanna bump that up whenever you're creating indexes, but realize that we're gonna use all of that memory. So just uh, be careful from that regard but it may, can make index builds go much, much faster because we have to basically sort everything. Uh, I talked about effective cache size a fair bit already, so I'm not really gonna cover it again. Um, auto vacuum, that really washes out the screen. I'm sorry about that. So auto vacuum, um, the defaults generally are too low in my experience for a high transaction rate system. Usually what you wanna do with auto vacuum is actually make it more aggressive, not less aggressive, right? What you wanna do is you wanna turn it up get it running more frequently because th those more frequent runs will end up running for less time, right? And it'll also be cleaning things up on a, in a more expedient fashion. So these are some different ways you can do that, decrease the cost delay or just completely turn off the costing model um, and increase the number of workers definitely if you have a lot of, if you have a very busy system, increasing the number of workers allows it to work in parallel across more, system, across more tables. Uh, managing connections, you can bump max connections up. I had some folks that were doing it up to as much as like 500. It's really too much in my opinion. Um, really where you wanna have max connections is you wanna have the number of connections that are actively working in the database along, you know, on par with the number of CPUs you have in the system. Generally speaking, that's the most efficient way of running a database server. One of the ways you can do that is use what's called PG Bouncer, right? PG Bouncer allows you to have, uh, is, is a connection pooler which allows you to have all your applications can connect to PG Bouncer, and then PG Bouncer will manage those connections to the database and will um, basically multiplex on top of those database connections. So it's a very effective tool. Uh, PG Pool also works. Um, watch for idle, and especially idle in transaction processes. Those are bad, uh, because if it's idle in transactions, that means that there's certain processes that we can't move forward with, like auto vacuum and vacuuming and cleaning up dead tuples. Almost done, folks. Managing locks. Um, so generally speaking, if you have a lot of objects in your system and you're using a PG dump based solution, PG dump has to actually connect and, and lock every object that it's going to dump out. And that can end up being expensive. So a lot of times I'll actually end up bumping this value of max locks per transaction up some so that there's enough locks available for a PG dump based backup. Um, a heavyweight lock is required for every object that's uh, accessed by a given process when it's connected. So not just PG dump, but your applications as well. Generally your applications aren't accessing that many different tables at a time, so it's not that big a deal, but be aware that we do create, we do take out a lock. I say heavyweight here, that's a Postgres terminology thing. Heavyweight in this sense means that it's a, it's a full level lock. It doesn't mean that it's actually blocking anything, right? Access share locks don't block anything except if you wanna like drop the table or something. All right, checkpoints. Uh, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but just make sure that your checkpoints are happening due to time. And if you have that log checkpoints option turned on like I was talking about earlier, every time we do a checkpoint, it'll say why it's starting and it'll say when it finished and it'll give you a bunch of stats about how many pages it had to write out, how many write ahead logs there were, that kind of information. The big thing is make sure it's always starting based on time. If it's starting based on X log, you're writing more X log than you have your system configured to be able to write out to disk in time. So you wanna make sure that you, you, basically that means bump up checkpoint segments, generally speaking. Um, the larger the checkpoint timeout, a lot of people change checkpoint timeout because you reduce the number of full page writes. 
um, and it also does some other things that are nice in that regard. But the higher up it is, the more write-ahead log that you may have pending when your database crashes and has to restart. And what that means is that the database will take longer to restart because it has to replay everything from the last checkpoint. So if your database crashes and you have checkpoint timeout set to five minutes, it shouldn't take more than five minutes for us to restart. If it's set to 30 minutes, it could take as much as half an hour to restart. Uh, PG Badger is really helpful and handy for uh, generating reports about queries. So if you're curious about what the query time information looks like against your database, um, I strongly recommend PG Badger. There's some configuration options. You can find it all on the web. All right, I have five seconds for questions. I will be at a bar somewhere, or you can find me after this if you have questions. I'll be happy to chat. Thank you. Uh, the, the slides will be up. I'll put them up on the wiki here in a few minutes.